Anyway, hey, good evening, guys. This is Pastor Gary, and I'm up here with Kev, and uh, uh, we, will, we will be leading you in worship tonight and in the Word. This is our Wednesday night study. We're very excited that you join us here at Calvary Chapel of Gloucester County. For those of you who come out to church, you know we started Esther, and uh, we're in the fourth chapter tonight. For those of you who don't come out, we go verse by verse, book by book, through the Scripture. And uh, as you join us tonight, hopefully there's some good lessons. I believe there's a really, really great lesson in the in the chapter tonight that we're going to discuss and deal with actually uh, very relevant in what we're going through here uh, in, in the world at this point. Speaking of that, let's remember, guys, you know, the social distancing stuff and everything else that we do, and let's make sure that we're careful, but we don't get led around by fear, uh, and we don't get led around by um, not understanding who's in charge. We know that God's in charge of each and everything in our lives, and we're so grateful for that, that's for sure. A couple things. Uh, we will have we will have our daily um, video going out, and uh, we didn't do one today. I was asked why not, and I said, "Well, we'll be here on at night." And so, but tomorrow we'll have another one that'll go out. So be looking for those each and every day, and I think that they'll uh, they help you stay connected. That's for sure. I know that Steve, our our family life guy, who's got a lot of children stuff that goes out there. So be on the lookout for that. I know my wife puts out stuff for the ladies. Uh, the men, uh, Ernie had put out something this past week. There's a lot of things that are going out. And of course, Sunday morning's 9.30. Uh, we, will, we, will, um, we will always be coming across to you in that way. I had mentioned it to you before, and, I, and, and we don't mention it often. But uh, thank you to those of you who are still keeping up with your giving and your tithing and things like that. You know, uh, I know it's, we don't push that a whole lot. And nor do I want to get into that. You know, we, we don't, we're just not real comfortable in pushing all those things. But I'm glad that you guys realize and that you are giving and that you understand that principle. So I just wanted to say thank you uh, for that. And um, so give till it hurts. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Just sounding good. Anyway, I, unless anything else I need to make an announcement tonight? No. Nothing? Steve? Good. All right. Well, let's just go into worship. Hopefully you have your Bibles with you. But put those aside for right now, and Kev's going to lead us in some worship tonight. So uh, if you're at home, sing along. I know it seems odd, and it's like, uh, I don't, I'm not real comfortable. Sing along. Listen, man, we're in a weird time. This is a great time for you. Just worship in the Lord. So, Kev, take it over. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Holy name, sing like never before. 
draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Yeah, come on, lift it up To bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh 
every fear, to bring healing to the broken and sick. We wait, Lord, help us to wait patiently like a bride, spotless and ready, waiting for the groom to come. I pray that all the craziness that's going on around us would not draw us astray or cause us to fear or cause us to lean on the crutches of the world. Lord, we see how fast and easy our freedom can be taken. We see how easy our health can be taken. We see how easy it is for our bank accounts to be plundered. We see how easy it is for the stores to go empty. But Lord, none of that is our rock. We don't stand on that stuff of earth, Lord. We stand on the rock of Jesus, never changing, never failing, unshakable and immovable, God. And we wait for you. We lift our eyes to the sky now more than ever in this craziness. Lord, I love this country, Lord, but just like every other kingdom that's come and gone, every kingdom today, America is nothing but a fancy sandcastle. And with waves that come, it will go down. But Lord, our kingdom is not of this world, Lord. Our citizenship is in heaven, Lord, and we are just pilgrims. Lord, remind us of that as we continue to worship, as we walk through this crazy time, Lord, that we are your sons and your daughters. And let us be a light as the days grow darker. Let us hold fast to your word. For such a time as this, God, let us bear your name in a way that makes you smile, in a way that you desire for us, Lord. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire A whole earth shame A whole earth shame And I see His love and mercy Washing over all our sin The people the people sing Hosanna 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 in the high And Hosanna 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 I see a generation, I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. 
And I see a near revival Stirring as we pray and see We're on our knees We're on our knees Hosanna and Hosanna Hosanna time i hope at home that uh you guys you're, you're you're opening up more and more i know it's kind of strange and all the rest of it but when you have the opportunity to do this and you do it over and over again you'll start to get more familiar now my prayer is that we don't get so familiar with it that it becomes second nature to us to have to do this uh because uh one of our uh, devotionals we sent out this past week was all about this idea of of missing you guys and wanting to get back together and I think I speak on behalf of each and every one of us when we say we, we want to get back to that part where we're able to come together and, you know, um, I, I know our social dynamics are going to change for a while and uh, you're going to see people that are freaked out about, you know, going up near somebody and all the rest. And you got to respect that, no doubt. Uh, but there's something about fellowship. There's something about connecting. There's something about uh, knowing that you have a brother and a sister in Christ. I, I, I said it before. And I'll say it many times, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, we, we need each other desperately. And uh, the reason that is is because 
there are many people out there uh, that come out to the fellowship here and many other fellowships. Their closest uh, brothers and sisters or, or aren't, their, aren't their biological brothers and sisters, but they're, they're the spiritual ones or the ones that they've connected to in the church. And, um, and I know, I hear it all the time. My phone blows up all day. And I love it from people connecting with me and asking questions and, and wanting to know certain things, but also just saying, man, I miss you guys so much and can't wait to get back to it. And, uh, you know, just keep looking up, right? Our redemption's drawing nigh. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for those that are still staying faithful uh, to Calvary Chapel here at Gloucester. We really do appreciate that. And uh, I want to commend you for that. Well, we're in chapter four and uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm thinking, why is this? It, you know, listen, when I, when I look at doing a book, I just start praying about it and I get impressed upon it and I think, okay. And it was just really strange, you know, with the idea of uh, Purim coming up, and of course now past, um, the, the Jewish feast and uh, an interesting feast. Um, but it's, it, the book of Esther is really kind of what is based around that. And so I was just kind of thinking, well, let's just do the book of Esther because it sort of goes into this time of the season with, with the Resurrection Sunday coming up. And, um, and then I realized once we're into it and with what's going on out there, this book is just an amazing book. The chapter tonight to me just blew me away, um, making me think through some things. And um, yeah, it, it's just fascinating to me. So why is this book so important in light of what we're going through? And I think it's summed up in Esther 4 and 14 and it. Um, and this is where I think Mordecai's statement, and it's the, probably the most famous text or thereabouts in this book. And who knows whether you have not um, uh, attained royalty for such a time as this, Esther 4 and 14. I think sometimes we, we do a, a little bit of an injustice to the book of Esther because we want to try to make Esther uh, this heroic figure. And we paint her as being this strong woman, especially I think in the days we live today, because the Bible doesn't offer up a lot of examples of, of you know, these strong women. It does have strong women, don't get me wrong. But sometimes we take Esther and I think we make her something that she's really not. And I think Mordecai's statement that he's making there is not necessarily a, a statement of affirmation, but it's a questioning statement. I think what he's saying to her there, and we're gonna get to this is, you know, I'm not sure if you're going to be the person to be used for such a time as this. I don't know if you are the person to be used for such a time as this. You see, what I want to delve into tonight is this question, this idea of what? Well, you know, God has put us all in an interesting time and place, hasn't he? I mean, God has said to us, guys, th there is a lot of strange, crazy things that are going on. I'm in control, but what are you going to do? How are you going to use this time? And uh, we're all in the same place to be used by God, or at least I hope we are. And I want to look at that tonight as we do. Real quick rundown. Chapter 1, we, uh, the book of Esther opens by describing the 180-day party thrown by King uh, Xerxes. It was his third year uh, as king of the Persian Empire. He would rule over 127 different provinces. And uh, so as these days drew close... He thought that he would summon his wife. Do you remember her name in your kitchen? Do you remember the name? Yeah, exactly. Her, uh, the name, of course, is uh, Vashti. And um, as the feast was drawing close, um, he summoned his wife to show off her beauty, is what the scripture leads us to believe. Many of the older Jewish writings and the older rabbis believe um, he wanted her to show up wearing her crown and only her crown. Uh, and of course, she wouldn't do that. She was a woman of integrity, intense integrity and immense integrity, and she wouldn't do that. And so she refused. Well, you don't refuse the king. You know that some people believe she was banished and some people believe that she was more than banished. And so she refused. The king gets rid of her because his ministers, if you remember, kind of heightened that all up. You know, uh, chapter two was uh, Xerxes regrets his actions, misses his queen. But according to the Persian law, the deed was already done. It wasn't like you could go back and overturn this deed. And obviously, if he killed her, you certainly weren't going to overdo that unless you were Jesus and you could come back from that. But she obviously couldn't. So um, the king's men saw that the king regretted what was going on. And uh, that may lead to some unrest. They decided right away uh, that they uh, would find a new queen. 
And so they held an elaborate, um, they held an elaborate beauty contest, as it were, to bring in these beautiful women from all over uh, the areas, from all over the Persian Empire, so he could select a new queen. So in the capital, Shushan, the, the name of the capital city, there was a Jewish girl there named Esther. Uh, well, actually, her name was Hadassah. That was her, her uh, given name, but they changed her name to Esther, which of course means star. She was considered one of the most beautiful women, and that will be borne out. And as I talked about last time, um, only behind Eve and Sarah, when it came to the Jewish writings, uh, Sarai, uh, was Esther considered, uh, she was only behind them in, their, in beauty, and their beauty was supposed to be uh, basically earth-shattering as it was. She grew up as an orphan, <clears throat> raised by her uncle, and her uncle, of course, is Mordecai, or Mordecai, and uh, one of the leaders of the Jewish people as they went off into exile. Remember, this is from the kingdom uh, in the south. This is from the, those who were ruling and reigning in Judah when they were taken away uh, for 70 years of captivity. Uh, Mordecai told her not to reveal that she was Jewish, uh, or that her heritage was, and, uh, and so uh, she was chosen because she was so beautiful. I couldn't hide her away or anything like that. She had to go through a 12-month process, if you remember, six months and six months before she would be considered fit. Now, this is one of the areas where I say, isn't it interesting? You know, now, it would be, it, it, look, it's easy for me, you know, thousands of years later to sit here and to judge uh, what Esther did, but if you remember, Vashti would not would not uh, compromise herself, yet we do see where Esther will compromise herself. Uh, Esther would go through with the plan. She will sleep with the king, whereas Vashti wouldn't do that. And so it kind of gives you an idea. This is not to poke any kind of uh, finger at Esther uh, to say anything other than she's not, uh, and I think this is better for our women and for all of us to look at her and realize she was a broken figure like everybody else is. She, she had her misgivings and her, and her shortcomings and everything else. Sometimes we paint these people in such this glamorous picture that we forget, hey, they're just people. This is what they are. And so anyway, uh, it says to us there, uh, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she carried charm and favor before him more than all the other virgins. So he placed the royal crown on her head and made her queen in place of Vashti. So Mordecai won't reveal his relationship to the new king at this point, but he will still go to the palace and check in with her. And um, it says to us there that it was on one of those occasions that uh, he discovered a plot that was coming against Xerxes. He made sure Esther heard about it, and Esther made sure it got to Xerxes, and uh, the, the assassins would be killed. And, um, uh, and uh, of course, Esther said, you know, this all came to me because of Mordecai. So chapter 3, really quickly, um, uh, it tells us that in the meantime, while all this stuff is going on, Xerxes appoints a man named Haman. Now this is when everyone boos and hisses, and he's an Agagite, as it were, you know, a Malachite uh, heritage. Haman becomes uh, the king's evil second in command, and he was a descendant of Agag, king of the Amalekites. We went through all this, we won't spend time, who were ancient enemies of God's people. He becomes the prime minister uh, at this point. And so, you know, he's very powerful. And in fact, he has a decree, uh, an edict put out that whenever he shows up, everyone should bow to him. Now, that gives you a lot of an idea of what a person like this is. If you're always looking for people to bow to you and you've got to put an edict out, you know, respect is earned uh, unless, you're, unless you're Haman. Haman demands that kind of respect. And uh, that's what he does. Now, we know that Mordecai will refuse to bow to him. Why? Because Mordecai's Jewish. Mordecai will not bow to anyone but God is who he bows to. It's also believed uh, by the writings that we read, the ancient writings, that Haman was known to wear a necklace, and on that necklace he had an idol. So there certainly was no way that Mordecai was going to bow before this man who would carry a pagan around on his neck. There's just no way he would do that. Now we also know that, as it points out, uh, Haman is uh, an Amalekite in his heritage, and the Amalekites were supposed to be wiped out. God said, I want you to wipe them all out. Because that wasn't done by King Saul, uh, Samuel points this out. You disobeyed, and of course he kills Agag, but the Amalekites continue on. And as a result of this, now the Jewish people are going to be threatened again because Haman's going to King Xerxes, 
and he promises Xerxes great wealth and asks for permission to destroy a certain people, if you remember. And he presents the king, um, uh, and he says, listen, these people are not loyal to you. They don't follow you. They're spreading out among anyone and everyone. Uh, their laws are different from other people's laws, and they don't observe the king's laws. Uh, they want to do evil. You can't leave these people alive. And <clears throat> anti-Semitism, by the way, which is exactly what they were doing, uh, throughout history, that's exactly what's always come against the Jewish people. Listen to the people that are critical of the Jewish people. Oh, they, yeah, they, they do their own thing. They follow their own laws. They don't, they don't you know, they're, they're into destroying. They're, they own the banks. They own this. They own that. They run this and they run that. And a lot of things get spoken of by them. You know, uh, when, the, when the plague, here's something fitting for you. When the bubonic plague was sweeping across Europe, uh, many of the Jewish people were being taken and killed uh, because they, the people of the day in their medieval thinking, because the Jewish people weren't dying in the same amount as they were. And so instead of finding out why that was, they put it to witchcraft and they said the, that the Jewish people, uh, they're causing the bubonic plague. When the reality of it was as simple as the Jewish people would have cats. The cats would eat rats and mice that were carrying it. It wasn't getting into their communities. You see, the other people hated cats, much like myself. So, but they, they were looking at the Jewish people. That goes to show you the mentality of anti-Semitism and, and how it gets started and how, unfortunately, it gets woven into so much. And so the king uh, agrees, and he says this edict is going to go out, and he gives it a year's time, and a year's time the people of uh, the Jewish people are going to be killed is what's going to happen. And so that brings us into chapter four. And we're going to spend a few minutes in chapter four tonight. And, um, and what I want you to focus on is how there comes a time in every believer's life. Now listen to me. There comes a time in every believer's life, and you're going to see this as we read this, where you have to make a choice. You really do. Are you going to, are you going to give yourself and be committed to the way God wants you to do something? Or are you going to look to take easy ways out of things, safe ways out of things? Uh, Esther's choice that she's going to be put into here um, is, I think, um, a pivotal moment for the believer's life. Uh, you can come to know Christ. You can say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Jesus person. I follow Jesus. But the question is, do you really follow Jesus? And are you doing the things he's asking you to do? And uh, when we're in the midst of a crisis like we're in now, are you looking to walk away from faith? Or are you embracing faith? Four says in, uh, chapter 4 says in verse 1, When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes, and out came Superman. That was for Steve Ample, by the way. <laughs> and he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and a bitter cry. It says that Mordecai learned something. He learned what happened. He learned that Haman had tricked King Xerxes into issuing this decree and now millions of Jewish people are going to be scattered, that were scattered throughout the Persian Empire. Remember, they've already been dislocated, dis dislodged uh, from uh, Judah and uh, Israel, their home, and they've been brought into a foreign land. That's already happened. And now they're being told again, uh, not only have you suffered that indignity, but now you're going to die. Why? Because you're Jewish. That's why you're going to die. It reminds me of why Christians die in the world today. And many Christians will die because simply they acknowledge Jesus as their Savior. Can you imagine for doing the thing that you and I do or hopefully do every day? You know, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love your word. Lord, I love to come before you. There are people who die for that. There are people who will die because they're Jewish throughout the the uh, pogroms and, the, uh, and all the atrocities have been committed against the Jewish people. He went as far as the front of the king's gate. Now remember, he's tearing things apart. He's pouring uh, uh, ashes on his head. What's he doing? He's, he's formally uh, lodging a complaint. This is how they would do it. This is, he was voicing his displeasure. He was showing how, how indignant and how upset he was with what's going on is what he was doing. And this was the way that they would do it. And uh, they would cry out loud and bitterly is what they would do. And he was trying to do this 
as close to the king. But the reality was, in that time and that place, you were not allowed to get where he was to do this. Why? The king, they don't want to upset the king. The king's powerful. The king has to make important decisions. The last thing the king should be exposed to are a bunch of people with... Uh, uh, who are upset with his rulings. And so, really, this was punishable by death, is what this was, as what uh, Mordecai is doing here. And so, the king doesn't want to be confronted and challenged with your problems. He's got satraps and everybody else to deal with that stuff. But you see, our king, Jesus, says what? You cast all your cares and your burdens on me. He said, I'll take them. Um, I'll carry them for you is what he says. You see, we have a king who's gracious to us and loves us and, and uh, wants to draw us closer to him. He's not going to push you away. So if you're lonely and if you're struggling and if you have problems in your life, you're wondering what's going on and you're being operated by fear, you just pull right up to King Jesus and he will accept you and he won't cast you out and he'll certainly listen to everything you're saying. Three says, and in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So it's not a, it's obviously not a cheerful time, and it sort of reminds you of what we're going through, a lot of unrest, a lot of people uh, hurting. And listen, as the days tick off here, um, unless we start seeing some changes, you know, in positive ways, uh, a lot of people's optimism will start waning more and more and more. Uh, and so what should we do as believers? Should we join in that chorus? Should we become uh, that same thing? Should we forget where our God is and how he's serving? So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. So on their way in and out of the, of the castle, as it were, they came up to Esther and they said, hey, this is what's going on outside. So she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and uh, take his sack, sackcloth away from him but he would not accept them. So she doesn't want him putting on this kind of a show. She's saying, you know, hey, listen, get him some suitable things to wear. First of all, I don't want the king to kill him. And second of all, listen, this is not a good look. You know, this is not good for me. This is, uh, if, I, I don't want the king thinking I have something to do with this. So uh, let's, and, and remember, she loves Mordecai. Why? Because Mordecai adopted basically her and raised her. She was, she was uh, her parents were killed and she was an orphan. But Mordecai refused them. Why did he refuse them? Because he didn't want to cover it up. What he was doing outwardly was showing what his heart was all about. And he knew that if you covered up what was going on, if he would have allowed Esther to do this, the people were doomed. The people were doomed. He needed this to be brought to light is what he needed to do. He knew that new clothes might keep him out of trouble with Xerxes, but it was certainly not going to save the Jewish people. So now they start out the original ancient email back and forth is what we're about to see here uh, in verse 5. Then Esther called, um, uh, his name is Hatak, Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. Now, she had an idea of what was going on, but she didn't understand the depth of it. And probably because, as a queen, she would not be allowed just to leave the palace and go out and wander around. Uh, especially with all this unrest going on, she certainly wouldn't be allowed. You guys, and, and we all understand what quarantined is. We all understand what it means to be locked away. Um, you know, many people in rooms right now where they're not allowed to leave, uh, you know, understand this principle. Well, being the queen meant that she had to sort of stay sequestered is what it was. It'd be pretty awful. So Hatak went out to Mordecai in the city square. She said, hey, go talk to him. And uh, that was in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. If you remember, it was worth millions of dollars. In other words, there was a motive on Xerxes' part to say, yeah, let's, uh, this is perfectly fine, what Haman's suggesting. Um, and so we have a motivation that's going to, and it's your husband, by the way, that's doing this, uh, Esther, uh, cha-ching. And he also gave him a copy of the written decree. In case you believe not my husband. He would never do this. There, there's, this is just a lie. Uh, so he gave him a copy of the written decree uh, <clears throat> for their destruction, which was given to Shushan, the capital, that he might show it to Esther and explain to her that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication 
uh, to him and plead before him for her people. <clears throat> why is she? Why is he saying this? Because <clears throat> this is a desperate time, which requires desperate actions. This is not time for status quo, is it? We can't just get away with status quo sometimes. Sometimes you got to go a little bit, a little bit more earnestly, as it were. And so that's exactly what's going on here. So let me ask you a question. When crisis comes, here comes my wife with some water. I appreciate that very much. With a team effort. <laughs> Did someone already unscrew the lid? No. <clears throat> it was a team effort. Oh, thank you. Thanks, baby. Um, everyone take a sip of your water. Hopefully your own water. Don't sip your neighbors. <laughs> Is that crazy? That's Alethea down there laughing. It's like crazy here up with her right there. So when crisis comes, some people see it strictly as doomsday, like, oh, we're done, we're over, this is it. I've, I've talked to many Christians um, who have varying ideas and, and, and what this is about. But what I like is when someone says, but it's an opportunity. You know, look, is it bad? Yeah. Can bad things come out of it? Yeah. Are there um, reasons that some of these things are happening? Certainly. But what's our opportunity? What's our response? What's our responsibility as a believer in all of this? Think about it. Esther's rise has been remarkable. Again, you know, um, parents die. She's just a little kid, raised by her uncle, um, swept away from her country, taken to a foreign land, as it were, uh, brought up uh, under Queen Vashti until she's disposed of, or deposed of, I should say. And then she wins out of the blue uh, Esther wins a, a, a beauty contest. I mean, how amazing is that? Why? Because it's all about God's timing and purpose and principles. Where does God want her? What does God want her to do? She's being raised at this time for such a time as this. Why? Because her people are going to be wiped out. Her heritage is going to be wiped out. And God's not going to allow that to happen. And so he raises this orphan girl up um, and gives her the giftings and the abilities that she needs to be put into the proper place. So the question is going to be, is she going to rise to the occasion? <clears throat> That's what we all have to ask ourselves, even in such a time as we live now. Will you allow God to use your giftings and abilities, and will you rise to the occasion, or will you simply fade away? Will you simply just kind of become apathetic towards it all? Will you turn inward? Will you start looking belly button in and not worry about what's going on around you? I've heard back in the day when people say things such as like, well, to hell with the world. And when you stop and you think about a statement like that, that's literally when we believers are not acting and doing the things that we should be doing, that's literally what we're doing. We're saying to hell with the world. That's not up to you and I to do that. Our calling is to see this world turn to Christ. And I love the song that we sang with Kevin Ledison tonight, and I love that line, you know, break my heart for what breaks yours. You know what breaks the, the Lord's heart? Are the lost, the unsaved, those who are dying without knowing Him, those who never develop relationship with Him. Guys, that's what breaks the Lord's heart. And I hope that breaks your heart. I hope that you're looking at opportunities that you have right now to go out and share your story with people, you know? That's a good question, isn't it? <clears throat> What's your story going to be when all this, if things continue, you know, and it's, it's going to get worse, they keep telling us, and then it'll start getting better until there's some sense of normalcy. What's your story going to be? What's your story been for the last 10 days? And what will your story be for the next 10, 15, or 20 days? What's that story going to look like? Did you hide out and do nothing? Did you, did you catch up and binge your latest Netflix uh, opportunities? Or did you actually do something for the kingdom? Now, I'm not saying you have to run around outside and, and, and go up to people on the street. First of all, you'd probably get punched if you walk up to somebody <laughs> on the street corner. So I would not say to do that. But what are you doing for the kingdom in this time? You know, are you going outside yourself? Is your heart breaking for seeing the way people are acting and fear around you and, you know, in these stores and everything else, you know? Um, I hope that you're looking at this outwardly and not inwardly, you know? <clears throat> I find it interesting. Nobody remembers the lack of greatness, do they? 
I read, I love to read history. And most of the history I love to read is about the great um, events in time. I love to read about people who rise above, you know, the circumstances, who stand out, who seize the moment. Are you gonna be a person who seizes the moment? You see, Esther right now is at a crossroads. Will she be a person who seizes the moment or will she be a person who fades away? Is that what's gonna happen with her? So God has appointed you uh, for this time. <clears throat> and so you're thinking, well then, okay, uh, everybody will rise up, right? Well, that's not what happens. And I, and I would tell you not to be so fast with that, Skippy, because not only is that not true, it usually doesn't happen that people, we, we've raised a bunch of Christians because we don't raise believers with the Bible, we raise believers with entertainment. And if your Christianity is based on entertainment, when trouble arises and you try to fall on your entertainment, your entertaining Christianity, you find that to be a very weak platform. If you're not standing on the Word of God, and if you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you, then you're just as fearful as everybody else. I would say take the Word of God, repent of the attitude that you have, take the Word of God, read it, and allow the Word of God to speak to you. Allow the Word of God to heal the heart uh, that you've allowed to be, unfortunately, um, fostered uh, as a result of all that. And so uh, let's, let's get back to our task at hand here. So you think, okay, we got Esther at this place. She's going to make the right choice. Well, verse 9, uh, when Hatak comes back, returns, and tells Esther the words of Mordecai, uh, then Esther spoke, or speaks, spoke to Hatak, uh, Elmer schooling, by the way. Um, <clears throat> then Esther spoke to Hatak and gave him a command for Mordecai. So she, he comes back and he says, Esther, this is what's going on. She says, well, you need to go tell him this. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman... Now remember, this is the woman that so many people look at and say, what a powerful woman, queen. Look at her. She's just amazing. She gives an excuse. Any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter. This is sort of like Willy Wonka and the Golden Ticket, except that it has nothing to do with that. But anyway, <laughs> except the one to whom the king holds out the Golden Scepter that he may live, yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So the first thing she says is, hey, listen, there's a law. And it's not like you can just get around that law. Uh, there is a law that he is going to kill me. The second thing is this. It says right there, I myself have not been called to go in to the king for 30 days. King and a queen, what are they? Married, right? She's saying, I haven't had my marital, um, uh, what word do I want to use? My maritable, marital Privilege. privileges. Thank you. I'm glad you look at it as a privilege, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> my marital, marital <laughs> privileges. My marital <laughs> privileges for 30 days, for 30 days. So you know they're not communicating, they have no conversation or anything else. And so Mordecai, you're saying, I should just go in there because I'm the queen and just say these things. But you don't understand, um, unless I'm asked to come in, I'm going to die. And on top of it, our relationship's not so good, you know what I mean? We, we need to get the latest Love and Respect series and watch that is what we need to do. So not being called there is going to make things a little shaky. Um, <clears throat> remember Queen Vashti that we talked about? You have a better chance at this time of finding Jimmy Hoffa than you do of finding Queen Vashti. Remember, he got rid of her because she displeased him. Well, what do you think he's going to do to Esther? You know, you got to look at it from the context that it's in and what it's written in. You know, sometimes um, you can be in the right place at the right time. You can be in the middle of this crisis and think, at such a time as this, I'm going to rise up. But you can also find that there's trouble. See, this is a good lesson. When you have great opportunity given to you to rise for the kingdom's sake, you also have to understand there's going to be a great cost that will be attached to it. If you have, if you have the opportunity to really shine and to really stand up, it's going to cost you something. I, I love um, what one person said when they said, oh, David said, David said, I will, I will offer nothing to the Lord that hasn't cost me something. I, I, I won't offer anything in worship to God that doesn't cost me something. And you gotta understand, when you take this kind of stand before the Lord, 
it's going to be costly. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, in her case, it was her life. In our case, it might be your reputation. Think about it. You know, if you stand up for the Lord in your workplace, people may find out that you're a Christian. Shocking, right? Or that you're one of those freaky Christians that actually stand up for the things of Jesus. You know, if you stand up for Jesus, you, it may cost you a job. It may cost you a lot of different things. It may cost you family members. But remember, Jesus didn't come to unite us and make us all happy. He came to give us the gospel, which is very divisive in a lot of ways. You have choices to make in your life, which can be very, very difficult choices to make. The question is, are you going to choose to make the right choice in spite of the outcome because you want to live a life pleasing to the Lord? Or are you going to choose to take the easier way out, which will give you relief temporarily, but that's all it's going to give you? Is it going to cost you? Absolutely, it's going to cost you to follow the Lord. What did it cost Moses to follow what God wanted him to do? He was a prince in Egypt. He had everything handed to him. He was, he was a muckety muck. In fact, Secular history writes about Moses, calls him a great general. But he was willing to forego all the riches, the Bible tells us, of Egypt. Why? Because he wanted to walk with God. Paul was willing to lay aside all the riches of this world, the educations and everything else, to do what? That he might be found in Christ. You see, there's always a choice, guys, that we have to make. Do I want the stuff of this world and find happiness in this world? Or am I willing to shed myself of all this to find true happiness and to tr find the true joy of walking with God? I found this little quote. I thought it was interesting. Many of us still think obedience to God is always defined by what we don't do. Let me say that to you again. Many of us still think obedience to God is always defined by what, by what we won't do. Things like, you know, not smoking, I won't curse. You fill in the blank with all those little things that you think, if I don't do this, I'm being obedient to God. But I think what I've learned more than anything else, more often than not, obedience isn't defined by what you don't do, but by what you will do for the world God so loved. <clears throat> it's not by all the things you're not doing. Obedience is defined by what is it you're doing for this world that God loves so much. And boy, if this isn't a time for us to not think about belly button in, but think about outwardly, this is the time. Be obedient to God. Still carry forth the Great Commission. Look, because this world is trembling right now, doesn't negate the fact that we have a Great Commission on our life. We need to be faithful in carrying out what we should be carrying out into this world. It desperately needs us more than, more than any other time. So become uncomfortable with, with this so that you can take this word out to people, whether it's by phone or by any other way that you need to do it. So anyway, let's continue on. Pick up in 12. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther. So now it's back and forth, back and forth, and now they went back, and, and she, and, and, and believe me, they said to Mordecai, hey, she's, there's a law against this, and she hasn't had conversation for 30 days, and blah, blah, blah. 13, Mordecai says, you tell Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jewish people. Oh, now remember, Mordecai's a little bit shaky in this whole story. Why? Because he kept telling her all along, don't let anyone know that you're Jewish. Don't let anyone know that you're Jewish. Don't let anyone know that you're Jewish. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jewish people. Listen, Esther, if you don't do anything about this, if you don't attempt it, you're going to die anyway. You're going to die. Hey, guys, you and I aren't appointed to dying right now, necessarily, in the way like she was going to die. <coughs> but what you and I have is if we're not faithful to what God calls us to do, you know what's going to die in our life? Your spiritual life, the blessings in your life, <coughs> The, 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 the vibrancy of a relationship between one another and between him, all those things start to atrophy. All those things start to decay. If you're not going to be faithful to what he wants you to do, and if you're not going to carry out what he wants you to do, this is exactly what goes on in your life. For if you remain completely silent, verse 14 says, at this time, 
Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Now, people always say, well, the name of God's not mentioned. You don't see God. That's God right there, by the way. That's, that's Mordecai pointing out what God's going to do. If you remain silent <clears throat> at this time, there will arise for the Jews from another place. Where's the other place? Well, God's going to provide. But you and your father's house are going to perish. Yet, who knows? Now, see, isn't this funny? See, we always quote that. For such a time as this, they make the movie. Everyone goes, oh, isn't this wonderful? And, and whatever. But the reality is that line is not a really good line for Esther's sake. Mordecai is challenging, questioning, are you the person that's going to stand up and be that person who's accountable at this time? Yet, who knows whether you have come to this kingdom for such a time as this. You haven't fulfilled what it is God wants to do with you. You haven't accomplished what God wants to do with you. How about you at home? God still has something for you. Is he calling you to go out and to carry forth what he wants? Now look, you may not ever have something that's known worldwide, but in whatever world you're living in, is God desiring to use you to see it changed for his glory Mordecai is challenging Esther, and I want to challenge you. Don't allow this opportunity to slip by in these days. You know, don't just waste them. Redeem this time because it's that important that you do those things. You know, people complain it's so dark out. Well, then you need to be light. People complain and say, you know, the, the world is running around without any, without any focus, without any compass. Then you need to be pointing away to Christ is what you need to do. You see, people that are weak, then you need to provide strength that you receive from the Lord. You see, there are things that you need to be doing for people in the world that we live, you know. Be the example of someone standing on a firm foundation, you know. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. She was pricked in her heart. Conviction's a good thing. Conviction's a good thing. Go gather all the Jewish people who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. Boy, there's something else you can do at home, right? Look, I don't even like to think of fasting because we bought so much food. Who wants to fast right now, right? doesn't seem fun right now. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> um, by a prior conversation that I had, by the way. Yeah, who wants to do that? But there's something you can do, right, for the condition of the world we're in and maybe for people that you know, uh, you know, the fear and everything. I'll start fasting before the Lord. Lord, what do, what do you want to reveal to me? Um, anyway, so not to eat or drink for three days or nights. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, by the way. And then she's like, well, if I perish, I perish. Now, was she saying that in a way like, like Thomas would say, well, let us go. If we're going to die, we're going to die anyway. Was she saying it like that? Or was she taking the, uh, was, she, was she like uh, Colonel Travis in the Alamo who drew the line and basically said, we're all going to die? Uh, was she saying it like that? Like, was it this gallon event? Or was it something like resigned to the fate of it? We're not quite sure by that. But we certainly know that she's stepping up to the plate at least now. And she's going to do, um, she's going to do what she's going to do. It's interesting that Paul is talking out of like, this reminds me of Paul in Jerusalem is what it was when he was on his way to Jerusalem. He didn't know what was going to happen there either. So very quickly, let's get down now to, uh, well, to the last verse there. I just want to close there. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all Esther commanded him. So next time we get together, we'll discuss... The, the outcome of what this is all about. I know it's sort of a cliffhanger. Those of you who read the word, read ahead, you know exactly what's happening, but we're going to tear that apart uh, in a little bit. Let me just read one quote from Warren Wearsby. And I have to have, come on up. Uh, Warren Wearsby said it this way, when God isn't permitted to rule in our lives, listen, when God isn't permitted to rule in our lives, he overrules. When John Mark refused to continue, God raised up Timothy to help Paul. When Jonah ran from God, he overruled using a fish. Now, are you going to allow God to rule your heart and your life? Or is God going to have to overrule in your heart and your life? 
I think it's better that we take up the posture of the Christian, right? Surrender. We just surrender to him in these times and say, Lord, just use me the way you want to use me. Let's uh, worship. because I don't know about anybody else out there. Uh, I, I pray uh, as we look up that our redemption is drawing nigh, that, that he will draw nigh even sooner. Um, but, you know, we, we long for that day. But while he tarries there and we're dwelling here, there are things that we need to be busy about. Choosing to follow him. You know, what is, what is better to give up than to give up something to follow Christ? What do you have to die to tonight? What is it that you have to be willing to relinquish so that you can be more fully committed to Christ? This is what I want you to do while you're home. If you're, if you're gathered with other people around you, I'm simply going to ask that you lay hands on one another, that you'd be willing to do that. As long as you, you know, you're living in the same house, I would imagine you're not practicing uh, you know, distancing from one another, as long as you can do that. Maybe a little personal connection right now would be a good thing for you guys. Um, and then I want you to pray for one another. I want you to pray. And you may say, man, I'm, this is awkward. I don't really pray a whole lot. Then just pray a little bit. You don't have to make some big KJV eloquent out there prayer. Just pray simply. Just simply go to God. God, please bless my daughter. Bless my son. Please bless my wife, my husband, whatever it is. God, please. And then think of people outside your little circle there that you're praying for. Pray for the church. Pray for us as a staff. You know, pray for these various things, you know, um, that we will be able to stay committed to what it is that God has laid on our heart to carry out. Pray for those things. Pray for the people that are sick. Pray for the first responders. Pray for all these people uh, that you can pray for. Hey, listen, when we go off the air, continue to pray. You know, there's no expiration date, is there? Certainly not for pray. And continue, continue, continue in the faith. And you watch how God will bring you through all of this. Father, once again, we thank you for allowing us to be here tonight, Lord. We thank you for calling us here. Uh, it's your purpose. It's your plan. We trust that. May we, like Esther, Father, decide to make the right choice, Father, and to follow and to stay close to you. And we're going to give you praise, glory, and the honor. I thank you for each person here tonight. I thank you for each person who's tuned in. Bless them, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. Good night, guys. Good night.